It's a pleasure to be here and be involved in this talk today. My focus is going to be on the anterior segment, and my title of the presentation is Navigating the Anterior Segment with Sclera Lens Focus. My name is Pratik Patel. I graduated from SUNY College of Optometry in 2017, shortly after did a contact lens and ocular disease residency in 2018 at Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. Currently, after my residency, I joined Wild Cornell's Department of Ophthalmology and New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. And so I've been there since 2018, working primarily in the cornea division with anterior segment and focusing on specialty contact lenses. And so the focus of my talk was introduced with talking about the anterior segment, kind of what I like to do, what are my passions. And so the first things that came to mind in anterior segment was sclera lenses. And that's something I do often in my clinic. And how do I integrate that with anterior segment pathology, anatomy, things like that. So kind of what I wanted to discuss was some basics with anterior segment, focusing primarily on two conditions, and then integrating technology and how to make my clinic more efficient. I often find technology being a nice way of streamlining things as well as getting being as accurate as possible. So I want to talk about um, anterior segment OCT technology, what's available for us today, specifically with scleral lenses and how we can utilize them, and briefly discuss about scleral lens technology, fitting processes, goals, and then discuss some cases as well. Basically, anterior segment. We know that the front third of the eye, um, we're really focusing on what we're seeing in front of the slit lamp, the gross structures as well. We break that down into the cornea, the conjunctiva, sclera, and then looking further in, talking about the anterior chamber, um, looking at the lens, zonules, things like that, where basically up until the front vitreous face. And so there's a lot of anterior segment disease that can occur within this, ranging from the dry eye disease spectrum all the way to herpetic conditions, even our cataracts, things like that, or corneal dystrophies, degenerations. And so there's a wide segment of things. And if I was going to talk to you about this, that 45 minute time slot would turn into three hours. And so what I really wanted to do was focus really on two conditions that we often will come across, the dry eye disease, corneal ectasias. And when I talk about scleral lenses, a very popular form and condition that is used for that. And so these two conditions are pretty much what I want to focus on today. And we know that there's going to be some great speakers later on in this event that are going to talk about some of the other diagnoses, He's primarily with glaucoma as well. So some great talks coming forward with that. Going back to the technology side of things, just want to introduce a little bit about that, talk about the basics. So we're so used to using OCT technology for the retina. We harp on it, we kind of get used to using it, utilizing and seeing those images and being very familiar with them. I felt that anterior segment OCT at the time wasn't used very often or in the sense of it was still up and coming and maybe it was an extra equipment or an extra lens that the externship site I was at didn't have or the school was that had, but it just wasn't on the same floor that I was working on or things like that. So oftentimes overlooked. And so anterior segment OCT, specifically now with some of the new technologies and availabilities, are a great tool. It's specifically being very precise with its measurements. So it can be used from the range of glaucoma using measuring the angle, tech, just looking at anatomy for you know specialty reasons, looking at blebs, tubes, uh, laser, iridotomy assessments, things like that. Even in a, you know ocular surface, just measuring pterygia, even scleroderma, things that get very specific for surgical aspects. So pre, post-op, co-management, seeing if a patient is a good candidate for certain surgical interventions, cataract surgery, biometry measurements, things that we've had other instrumentation, how can we integrate this newer technology for more accurate measurements and just kind of checking for progression, things like keratoconus. This can be used in keratoconus for progression check and just monitoring things such as tumors, even infiltrates that are occurring keratitis, things like that uh, with epi defects and whatnot. So there's a wide spectrum that can be used. We know I was discussing that there's various forms. You know, when I think about anterior segment OCT, I think about um, this is an example of a Vasante OCT, but a separate instrument that takes measurements of the anterior surface. Moving forward, there are various manufacturers. Um, myself, the clinics I work in at Wild Cornell, we often have a lot of Zeiss instrumentation. So we use a lot of the Cirrus OCTs in many of our offices and different floors that we're on. And so the idea of we just got a brand new Cirrus OCT on our 12th floor, which is our primarily plastics and cornea. And so that's where I'm at often as well. And so it has in this new anterior segment module, which is fantastic, where it allows me to place a lens on the surface of the OCT machine, get anterior segment pictures, um, get some pictometry measurements, as well as the angles and things like that. I believe um, Heidelberg also has similar technology. So however, you know, me primarily working with 
um, Zeiss instrumentation. It's been really nice to have these tools to kind of play around with. And it's still early on in my process of kind of getting used to them, but it's really nice to use this specifically with my scleral lens and following a lot of patients with keratoconus. Transitioning into going back into just talking about conditions, things like that for anterior segment. Like I said, I want to focus on um, keratoconus and dry eye. So briefly, just kind of discussing the conditions. And we know that keratoconus is a chronic non-inflammatory ectasia of the cornea, often asymmetric. It's bilateral, but often asymmetric. We often see characteristic signs on the slit lamp with central, infrocentral corneal steepening, which often you can see thinning on the slit lamp, visual distortion that the patient will describe as well as, you know, scissoring on retinoscopy. And then, you know, we talk about this apical corneal thinning, scarring, things like that. But in general, you know, we do often see these patients, but the incidence is about two in 100,000 with the prevalence from ranging from 55 to 60 per 100,000. In general, we know that um, there are many different ways that we can characterize and stage keratoconus. There's very different stages. And with new technology, the characterization and definitions change quite a bit. But at the same time, it may be that it's not the same qualifications because we're often talking about you know, procedures, surgeries, and using you know, different treatment patterns and what is the proper numbers. But going back to just the characteristic features, we talk about Fletcher ring, which are iron deposits at the base of the cone. We talk about corneal thinning, looking at the apex or inferiorly slightly using a thin optic section to see those measurements or kind of see those curvature or the protrusion. You see these vertical stress marks, or which we you know, define as the Vox striae. You know, in more advanced cases, we see apical scarring. You know, there's all these other different months inside and things like that that we can see from the outside perspective of the corneal ectasia. That being said, you know, what kind of testing are we doing to monitor these patients or even diagnosing these patients? So obviously, you know, keratometry measures a three millimeter area of the cornea. So we don't get a lot of information with the keratometer, but at the same thing in our practice modality, we're using an autorefractor. We see a lot of astigmatism and then this patient isn't able to get to a clear 2020 describing distortion. We often go then to the next step of uh, topography using instrumentations like a pentacam that does a tomography showing posterior elevation. We can get a very precise idea of the corneal shape to say this patient has keratoconus or it's progressing. So again, we often see, for example, this is a patient of mine that has this typical path mnemonic nipple cone type of structure centrally with steepening. We can see the corneal thickness map showing thinning centrally as well. And so there are a lot of great information that these different types of topography show, pachymetry as well. And I'll talk about why those things are important as well in procedural modes. Things like endothelial cell count, oftentimes the case when we're talking about um, corneal transplants, those are measurements that are very important in patients that are post-transplant due to keratoconus with the changes due to the age of the transplant and things like that when we're using implementing scleral lenses. ECC is another value that's very important. HVID on these patients important, again, more for contact lens terminology. And then anterior segment OCT, how are we implementing that? How can we implement that as far as um, checking for progression? I'm going to talk about that a little later when I talk about some cases, but going back to the patient management side of things. And so patient care, what are we trying to do with patients with keratoconus? Obviously, we have the management and treatment aspect of things, and it kind of is interchangeable. But what is the goal? You know, we obviously want to improve visual acuity for these patients and avoid eye rubbing. Very important. You know, we talk about environmental and genetic factors, a combination of both. And so we really want to aim with eye rubbing, especially if we can implement um, uh, topical medications, you know, Padaday is available over the counter now, which is fantastic option for patients as well for that, you know, oftentimes are rubbing their eyes to help relieve any itching sensation. And so and then going to, you know, visual correction, we often have these mild forms of keratoconus early on. Are we going to use spectacles? Are they early enough for spectacles or even contact lenses are available or even a custom soft keratoconic lens or even just a commercially available toric lens can often work for these patients. You know, I have a lot of patients that use a Biofinity Toric XR, works out really well and are commercially available. So these, it's a spectrum and, you know, that's kind of that mild and even going to moderate to severe, you know, utilizing specialty hard contact lenses such as, you know, corneal RGPs, looking at nipple cone lenses or larger diameter corneal RGPs are great. Nothing and shouldn't be forgotten, even though I keep harping on scleral lenses, definitely not something that should be forgotten, as well as hybrid lenses for patients that can't really, you know, find tolerance to uh, corneal RGPs, just the comfort aspect that hybrids provide that. And then scleral lenses that provide that comfort um, as well because of the stability and also, you know, the ability to provide, you know, 
liquid relief as well for a comfort aspect and for any dryness and things like that. And treatment, we have corneal cross-linking that was FDA approved in April of 2016, which is utilizing riboflavin and UV light to create stronger collagen bonds or cross you know, structures to help prevent any progression. So what's happened already has already ha- you know, occurred. We really can't change that. But aside from that, can we help lessen and slow down the progression, which has been great. In the U.S., like I said, in 2016, FDA approved for a specific type of epi off Dresden protocol and using a specific instrumentation. Although there are, you know, practices around the country using very different, you know, following guidelines from around the world of different strategies in incorporating different procedures, incorporating cross-linking at different, you know, speeds, intensities, incorporating PRK, things, all of that are being utilized. Another is interest, interstromal uh, ring segments. A lot of our corneal specialists in my department don't really utilize this at all anymore, but there are many practices around the country and around the world that still do, basically utilizing PMMA rings to flatten the cornea or corneal apex steepening. And so that's often used, and this is an OCT image of a patient I have with scleral lenses that has already gotten cross-linking and has had interstromal ring segment that was done in Argentina for them. Um, and then finally, you know, we have our tr- corneal transplantation, which is our full thickness penetrating keratoplasties, and then also our specific segment keratoplasties like our DALCs for our keratoconic patients. And so oftentimes we are seeing with the hopes of cross-linking and utilizing technologies as, you know, with contact lenses that keep visual improvements for a while, a good visual improvement for a while that we're reducing the need for corneal transplants. And, you know, obviously that'll help with reduce the need for, you know, graft failures, you know, rejection, things like that. Dry eye disease, the next thing I wanted to talk about, often called keratoconjunctivitis sica. We often see this clinic at the same time, you know, what is the prevalence, you know, it ranges from 7 to 34%, even higher with higher ages or with increased age going to 50%, et cetera. But it depends on the study we're looking at. But this is a multifactorial condition that often has an effect on the tear film and oftentimes has this tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, which is kind of the two cruxes of this condition, if we kind of break it down, which can often lead to ocular surface inflammation, damage, and then neurosensory abnormalities. There are many different factors that play. Obviously, I mentioned age, gender, different medications, environment, using contact lenses, history of LASIK, numerous factors. These patients are often complaining of pain, discomfort, light sensitivity, redness, tearing, blurry vision. Ways that we tell clinically, obviously, is our decreased uh, tear breakup time using ocular surface staining, such as our fluorescein, lysine green, rose bengal, measuring the tear meniscus, using Shermer's, assessing meibomian gland dysfunction, different scanning technologies, hyper uh, tear film, hyperosmolarity, MMP9, all these things are used to help kind of see and assess in a quantitative and qualitative measure, what is the severity of the dry eye and how do we treat this? This is kind of so the tear film ocular surface society and the dues group specifically, they have their dues one back in 2007, I believe. And then 2017 came out with their dues two dry eye workshop study to report. And this is just kind of talking about the pathophysiology of dry eye in the sense of we have evaporative dry eye disease versus aqueous deficient dry eye disease and kind of breaking down and kind of seeing how they mesh together. And it is kind of a spectrum and that at the end of the day, we still have tear hyperosmolarity right in the center of it that plays a factor. Now, are there lid reasons that the tear film instability is occurring evaporative? Are there systemic autoimmune conditions, um, any systemic anti- or inflammatory conditions causing this? So very multifactorial, as I was mentioning. You know, going back to more severe ocular surface conditions, secondary to, you know, systemic conditions, this is when we talk about, you know, very intense symptoms and in cases such as Steven Johnson syndrome, Sjogren's, Graves, graft versus host disease, ocular supratricular pemphigoid, limbal stem cell deficiency, exposure, and there's many more that we can break into, but these are the ones that we often see coming in in my, in my clinic that um, are referred from the cornea specialists or from outside providers that are looking for specifically scleral lens involvement because they've kind of used many different treatments with minimal improvements and trying to find something else to provide stable vision and comfort. And so going back to the uh, two study, this kind of shows a very nice flow of the treatment modality for patients that are asymptomatic that we find symptom or signs and that are symptomatic. And so I like this, you know, flow of kind of describing how we would go about dealing with these patients. But I like how at the bottom of this graph or of this flow diagram, you do see that, you know, we have our aqueous deficient, evaporative, and mixed. 
And we can see how this is still a spectrum, right? So this is kind of different with, the, with dues to kind of how they've a, able to clearly define dry, dry eye and then also kind of talk about how it's a spectrum and how we're treating it. But the biggest thing is, is this pa these patients are basically knocked off and off their homeostasis level. So how do we get them back and restore this homeostasis level? And so that's what I really liked about the DUCE 2 study and report kind of going through that and describing kind of treatment regimens and kind of stepwise. And we actually utilize this quite a bit in our dry eye clinics and basically kind of going step one, you know, our basic patient education, artificial tears, uh, micro, like MGD education, you know, all of those. And then step two is when we start to implement more intense therapy, but maybe trying punctal occlusion, punctal plugs, uh, more prescription medications like our um, cyclosporins. And then if that doesn't help going to the next step or going into our autologous serum treatments, implementing therapeutic contact lenses, whether it's a soft bandage lens or even a rigid scleral lens, and that's kind of where we're, we're going to take our next step. But then our fourth step is even further implementation of surgical approaches, amniotic membrane, pro, uh, Procara, long-term steroid use, uh, punctal occlusion surgically, and et cetera. So those are aspects that are even more severe. So kind of breaking it down into those four steps can kind of help in how we want to look at the treatment regimen and algorithm for dry eye treatment. But really what I wanted to focus on in the bottom third, uh, this presentation is more how do we implement scleral lenses? And like I said, the reason why I want to talk about this is that I just find scleral lenses one of my passions and kind of talk about how do I implement it in anterior segment pathology and some newer technologies and tips on how I find I've been successful with scleral lens, specifically with keratoconus and dry eye, but kind of breaking it down into um, the history of scleral lens, just a brief history. In the 16th century, Leonardo da Vinci first conceptualized this idea of a lens covering the eye. Technology was not there, of course, even so that it was just drawings, ideas. And then, you know, obviously in the 18th, 19th century, uh, 20th century, we started getting more utilization due to improvement in technology, whereas in 1912, Zeiss actually created the first scleral lens fitting set, which I thought was cool. Um, and so fast forward to the 1980s, 1990s, technology improved quite a bit more to a better material, more breathable material, where we talk about gas permeable technology, or even the PMMA, the switching over to the gas permeable technology, these lenses became more uh, reintroduced into this clinic flow. And some of the pioneers of this were Don Ezekiel, Weiser, and Ken Pullum. They were able to reintroduce this back into fold and kind of now in vogue type of treatment protocol for some of these patients as well for visual uh, enhancement as far as uh, visual improvement and comfort. And then fast forward to 1994, Boston Pros, the prosthetic replacement and ocular surface ecosystem was FDA approved. And now present, we have over 18 manufacturers, if not more, U.S. manufacturers that are making commercially available scleral lenses. And so the times have changed where there's a lot of availability based on um, where you are, you can have a lab that works best for you. Again, scleral lenses, I like to break it down into corneal irregularity treatment, ocular surface treatment, and then refractive error treatment. And so there's a lot of uses and indications that we can use scleral lenses. And so obviously with our irregularities, so looking at scleral lens indications, there are a variety of scleral lens uses. And so we often break them down, as I discussed previously, is this corneal irregularity and ocular surface protection. And then in, in, in addition, uncomplicated refractive error. And so corneal irregularity, we often we talk about our ectasias, our you know, keratoconus, pellucid, corneal dystrophies, post-transplant, things like that, scarring, you know, herpetic uh, disease, ocular surface protection is you know, where we're talking about those severe ocular surface disease that I was talking about from Steven Johnson's, GBHD, Sjogren's, exposure cases due to lag ophthalmos, trauma to the lid and things like that. And then in addition, uncomplicated refractive errors, which are degen myopes, aphakic patients that weren't able to be successful in glasses or other types of specialty contacts or just contacts in general, that these are a great option for them. Scleral lenses, again, the way the idea works is that we're vaulting over the cornea. We're using preservative-free saline solution, 0.9% sodium chloride, to vault over the cornea to provide one, clear vision, and two, comfort and lubrication. But the way the anatomy of a scleral lens works is we have this optic zone, which is our kind of our base cur curvature centrally. Then our transition zone that turns into this intermediate zone that we're talking about near the limbus, and then our landing zone onto the conjunctival scleral area. And so when we're talking about scleral lenses, I use this as a common chart that's used a lot. And I find it a little outdated now in the way we term it. We oftentimes use the terminology. Obviously, we use the term scleral lens, but technically 
A scleral lens is something from a 18 to 25 millimeter range, whereas a mini scleral is 15 to 18, which is commonly what we're using. So again, maybe terminology change in the future comes forward, but in the sense that this is kind of our breakdown in the size structure. And you'll see kind of my flow as far as I'm gonna be talking about how do we utilize potentially larger diameter scleral lenses in our practice. Uh, the way we assess lenses is that we're going to use a slit lamp to assess with white light, you know, diffusely. We're going to use um, a cobalt blue filter with fluorescein strips um, to get a look, again, um, diffusely as well, an optic section to get a look at the central clearance, things like that. And in implementing anterior segment OCT technology and how do we utilize that in assessing very specific micron values of the clearance of the lenses, as well as how does it landing on this conjunct of the scleral as well, as well. Many of you might have seen that this is a great tool through Ferris State University, their scleral lens fit scale, which shows us, you know, kind of the fitting goals of where we want central vault, limbal vault, and what is an ideal edge alignment. So centrally, we want vault and we want clearance. And we want clearance that, you know, is going to provide no areas of touch along the cornea. And so it's gonna vary, you know, you hear many different things, many different studies, but you wanna make sure after the lens settles, we wanna have an adequate amount of clearance and you can use the lens thickness, cornea, which can be challenging sometimes to compare that, or again, using anterior segment OCT to measure specific values. Intermediate zones is where that limbal clearance comes into play. So you really wanna make sure we're not um, providing a hypoxic environment with too much clearance or too little clearance causing, you know, microcystic edema, edema that's gonna cause very much um, a bad outcome for the patient because we know the limb limbus is so important for the patient for the cornea and so scleral alignment again this is something that patients are going to feel um, this is going to be the first thing that they're going to notice is it going to be too tight is it going to be too loose do they feel it when it's moving is it too uh, around the edges and so you really want a soft and wide landing area you're going to have you know too much edge lift patient's going to feel it if it's too tight and you're gonna get blanching or impingement, you're gonna cause some discomfort, you're gonna have difficulty removing the lens. And so this, again, this fitting skill shows really good information on what these scenarios look like. And it's a great tool to compare when you're fitting and especially early on when you're fitting. So you wanna avoid central touch, limbal touch to avoid any edema, any staining. You wanna avoid bubbles if the lens is too loose, blanching, impingement, excessive edge lift movement. We wanna avoid those things and try to find a nice happy alignment pattern. So next up, I'm going to go into our cases. And so I have four cases I'm going to talk about. First one, I'm talking about a patient with keratoconus. And so this is a 63-year-old male that I'd recently seen, actually, right as COVID started. There was a little pause in between. But that being said, he had history of hypertension, uh, chronic kidney disease, but over 40 years of keratoconus with the diagnosis for that long. And he had recently, you know, came to our practice because he would came for cataract consultation and had just recently had cataract surgery. Cornea specialist uh, referred him over to me for a specialty lens eval. History of RGP wear that he um, stopped it to poor tolerance as well as hybrids as well, just could not get used to them. Two years ago, he had been fitted locally uh, at a practice with scleral lenses, but stopped due to fogging. And, you know, his practitioner tried many different things, but was the patient wasn't able to succeed with scleral lens wear because of this fogging after an hour or two. And you can see here overall, the patient looking at the topography, pretty diffuse keratoconus um, with the K-max in the high 50s, mid to high 50s. And again, like I said, this is an older patient, so we're not worried about progression. This patient is past his 40s, past his late 30s, we're not really worried about as much progression. So again, we're not thinking about cross-linking at all for this patient at this time. But we know visually, you know, with glasses, he gets down to 2050 in the right eye, 2025 in the left. So we know the visual potential is pretty good even with that, but he knows distortion is there and he knows the visual, how vision can be improved with scleral lenses. So this is the time when I actually got to be introduced to our new Zeiss uh, with our Cirrus OCT with the new anterior segment module. So I got to test it out with this patient and got to seek some cool values. And so basically using a, one, a different lens on top of the Cirrus OCT, you get these measurements and you get the picture of a cornea. And it, basically this takes about, uh, I believe it's like a nine millimeter segment of the cornea with about 24,000 data points, 24 OCT B scans, radial B scans, and gets you this information of the pachymetry. But what's also cool is it also gives you epithelial thickness as well. And so there's recent studies that are showing, you know, is there a correlation with epithelial mapping and with keratoconus progression? And also, you know, overall, just like surgical pre-op and post-op for certain um, surgical conditions for cornea um, and seeing how you can see post-op, pre-op and how the eye is healing. Again, I'm fairly new with this technology, but just the idea of another tool to measure progression is very important, I think. And I think specifically knowing that um, cross-linking is FDA approved 
However, getting it covered by insurance is a whole other conversation and it can be fairly tedious. And so adding another tool to show that, you know, there is progression based on some of the changes with the mean and max epithelial thicknesses is going to be a great tool once we get some more information and more data and we can see, you know, what are some of the trends with that. But I think it's going to be a very useful tool, especially for these keratoconic patients. Within that same picture, I was able to get this lens photo with the patient giving a pretty wide range um, centrally of the lens, the scleral lens over the cornea. So this gives me a good idea of how the lens is sitting with the central clearance and as it's approaching the limbal area. And so this is the picture of the right eye and left eye. This was actually pretty quickly after I applied the lens. So we can see the clearance was quite high, you know, so it's going to settle a little bit, but this is a cool picture and a very clean photo, in my opinion, of what the lens looks like on the central area of the eye for clearance and checking the vault. But again, a nice tool that we can measure the clearance specifically in micron values. So it's very important when we're talking with consultation, how we can utilize these values for patients that need changes for warranty exchanges and things like that. If there's too much clearance, minimal clearance, et cetera. In addition, I like to use prior to that, you know, I was still using a, um, a serious OCT, but I was using the anterior five line raster segment, which doesn't need a lens attachment. But what it does is I can actually have the patient look at different gazes and kind of hone in on different areas. So if I want to look at the superior edge or limbus or temporal edge, or, it allows me to do that. But this takes a little more time teaching and training with your imaging staff, or if you're doing it yourself, and so that's the aspect of utilizing these technologies and getting a sense of how much time to invest with this. But at the same time, you get very accurate values. And what you can do is this can help reduce your lens remakes because you know what kind of changes that you want to make. And so it helps kind of down the line. So this is actually a photo of the same patient after the lens settled onto the eye. So basically I had the, lens, the patient and then I had him come back for his follow-up after two, you know, at least wearing it for over four hours. So we can see that lens settling onto the eye. But going back to it, you know, looking at the edge profile here, we know it's a, it's a nice soft landing. Um, and we know that the limbus here on the right side uh, is about, what do we have measured? 50, 61 microns, which is a little, you know, we can still work on that, but in the sense of a very comfortable fit. In addition, going back to it, this was, he, he was able to achieve comfortable 20-20 vision in a 16 millimeter lens, but we incorporated a toric haptic in the periphery. And so what that was, is we know that the conjunctiva and sclera is, asymmetric in nature, is toric in nature. We've seen a lot of information about this and a lot of information coming out with studies. And so lenses, and this has been, it's been a few years now that are offering this toric peripheral availability to provide this, you know, more alignment fit. So, you know, you're going to have a quadrant that's steeper and a quadrant or a meridian that's steeper, a meridian that's flatter. And so kind of conforming to our normal uh, conjunctival asymmetry. And so this is just an example of when this symmetry is off, we can see fluorescein leaking into the lens. So you often can, you know, put a strip of fluorescein or, you know, wet it, put it on, along the edge and see how the fluorescein flows to get a sense of where are the areas that need to be adjusted, where is it leaking? And that's where these fogging can occur. Obviously, there's different ways we talk about, you know, using a thicker gel drop to make a cocktail solution, but how can we adjust the fit? And for this toric floral design, um, provides the alignment pattern and is oftentimes used for many times with keratoconus specifically because we get these lens patients that, you know, the lens oftentimes decenters. This will help um, provide more centration with more toric design or quadrant specific designs. The next patient is a patient of mine that I saw during residency for keratoglobus. And so he was a 38 year old male with a medical history of cutis laxa, which is a collagen disorder. He had been diagnosed with keratoglobus and was referred to our medical center, to a cornea division uh, for further evaluation. He had a history of a very small globe rupture 10 years ago. And going back, talking about keratoglobus a little bit, it is a diffuse limbus to limbus, corneal protrusion or corneal thinning. So compared to keratoconus where we have this, you know, infracentral thinning, we get this more pronounced limbus to limbus protrusion and thinning. And so this is something that's a little different, also non-inflammatory, but it's bilateral, often present at birth, but you know, it isn't very much a progressive condition, but also is associated with a lot of collagen disorders. And so cutis laxa is one of them um, that is similar to, you know, elostanlos, things like that, but affecting a different systemic system or different um, areas of the body. 
that being said, you know, with his best spectacle vision was 50, 20, 50, 20, 70. So again, not terrible, but again, he'd been suffering with blurry vision for the most part and a lot of light sensitivity as well. But upon, you know, examination, he has quite a bit of peripheral thinning and he had that, he has a little bit of opacity in the left eye because of that, uh, uh, because of that little lobe rupture. We can see in this photo very superiorly that there is quite a bit of thinning as we look. And so when we took a look at the topography, and again, very light sensitive, so we couldn't get the best quality photos, we can see this patient, you know, again, very difficult to tell, but, you know, thinnest area is 184 microns, the right eye, left eye, 194, so very thin. And so, again, very steep, max K max of 70, um, 60, so very steep as well. So these type of patients, we want to go larger. We want to provide a more sagittal depth. And so the larger the lens we go, the larger the sagittal depth, less congestion of the limbal area. And so this patient, we fit in a Boston Tight scleral that we were able to go to an 18.5, provided 20-20 vision in the left and right eye. This is one of the photos that I found very pronounced so that we can see that area of thinning. It's very, very thin and below the 200 micron area. Apologies, I don't have the actual measurement, but we can see this patient is very thin. So this was a case that I wanted to use as an example of more exaggerated in the sense of patients that have very much advanced keratoconus, for example. What do we do? What kind of treatments do we want when we need a scleral lens? So we want to use a large lens. We want to make sure we have a higher sagittal depth. We want to make sure we're not congesting the limbal area. So we want to go larger. And so this is an example, an extreme example of it. These patients that often that we see are advanced may be very thin. Now, are these patients that are going to say, go do a corneal transplant because of that? A lot of these patients can actually be successful wearing a scleral lens, even being in the hundreds and things like that. Again, these are monitored very, very closely. And again, very closely with their cornea specialist, but you know, may be able to kind of push a corneal transplant a little further down the line with the utilization of a scleral lens. In addition, we have more customizable options as well, where we can use impression molding technology with iPrint Pro or scleral topography with, uh, you know, SMAP or Eaglet, various versions of that, that we can get a very customizable lens for these very ecstatic eyes. So that's newer technology that we can utilize as well for these patients. Now we're going to transition over to our dry eye uh, patients. So basically, we're going to talk about two different cases here as well. So our dry eye, first case, 26-year-old female. Uh, history of ankylosing sp spondylitis with the uh, treatment of Humira and methotrexate. She's also, so she's on immunomodulators that are providing her, you know, treatment for that. But in addition, she had LASIK four years ago. She's also a medical student that is in settings that are very dry environments, very much uh, resulting in severe dry eye. She had been seen locally by a local ophthalmologist close that works closely with us and had been on numerous, numerous therapies, but was referred over for scleral lens fitting. So we can see uncorrected, her vision is doing just fine 2020, although it varies from day to day based on her ocular surface, but you can see the numerous aspects of the therapies that she's on. So we know that, you know, she's on restasis and very unique treatment patterns where you can see restasis four times a day, Zydra twice a day, Lotamax, things like that. Um, she's on autologous serum tears, uh, using azocyte, punctal plugs, she was using Procaris treatments as well, but all with mild improvements. She was doing well with wax and wane. And so we wanted to use scleral lens technology to help her. And so we used, again, another large diameter lens. So with dry eye, we want to provide good large coverage. And so we want to not just you know, protect the cornea, but we want to protect the conjunctiva as well. And so these type of patients, we want to go as large as we can. Eight, so I utilized, again, the Boston Sight Scleral, which is a great lens that we were able to utilize um, up to 18 and a half millimeters. And so this is a photo, again, anterior segment, five line raster scans of the cornea with the scleral lens on. So we can see centrally, mid peripherally, and the landing zone. You want to remember settling time as well. In addition, this patient was look, uh, complaining of fogging. So as you can tell, actually, this OT OCT is a great example. Our reservoir area that's very much dirtier, you know, what you can see is this fogging of the liquid. And you can actually tell quite a bit that there's surface, there's debris within there in this image here. And so this patient specifically, and this is the left eye, very similar, we're getting a lot of fogging in the eye. So one of the things to remember is the larger lens we go, the more toricity in the sclera. So there's going to be changes and a little more asymmetry. So there's going to be areas that are going to be loose that provide portals of entry for fogging. And so we have to look into that option. In addition, other things we need to think about is that this, for this, for example, this patient, we ended up having to use a little larger thickness lens. Being a young patient, we have to think about our DK. We have to think about oxygen permeability to the patient. And so we want to use a high DK material. So this patient here, 
we utilized eventually Optimum Infinite, which is a new material, newer material that has a hyper DK material of 180, which is fantastic, great results. So there are also other versions that are a little less to provide good DK value to provide the, the best DK as well. And so obviously we want to utilize and we try to get as low vault as we can. And so one of the things uh, before I talk about that is that going back to the scleral asymmetry, one of the cool things about Boston's sites, uh, fitting protocols and other brands also have similar online fitting, you know, suites as if you want to call it that is they can adjust it in Meridian specific and you can actually go and change it in micron values. You can adjust the each meridian, you can adjust the limbal clearance, you can adjust the sag and things like that. And, you know, various specialties of this lens and very customizable. So it's a nice way of also getting exact measurements and getting better alignment for the eyes. So we were able to utilize this for the patient and get very good, clear and reduce the fogging for the patient for the majority of the day. It's going to be tough with severe surface disease patients that uh, to prevent fogging completely. You know, there may be a realistic expectation they have to take a lens out midday, refill it, even with utilizing different coatings and things like that, different fittings, using a cocktail solution. And so something to keep in mind and kind of make a realistic expectation for patients when we're seeing these things. And going back to the settling time, we know that the lens is going to settle onto the sclera. We want to make that and predict that. And we want to know with studies, we've seen about 150 to 200 micron lens settling. And oftentimes we do see it more so of a settling in surface disease patients. And so we want to make sure we're keeping that in mind. So starting with a little bit more generous vault in the beginning, as we know that this lens is going to settle over time. And my final case here is discussing a patient with Stephen Johnson syndrome. And so just uh, prefacing the case, so Stephen Johnson syndrome is a hypersensitivity drug a reaction to a medication, various different types of medication, um, which result in blistering of the skin, involvement in many different organs throughout the body that also include the eyes themselves. So ocular involvement of Stephen Johnson's can result in severe PPE, dryness, staining, to keratinization, cicatricial changes, some blepharon formation, ulcerization, uh, perforation, very intense changes to the eyes and the eye structure resulting in severe, severe eye dryness. These patients have the tough time keeping their eye open and really much their vision is affected. And so this is a 47 year old female that I saw when I first started out at, at Cornell that was diagnosed with uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome due to presumably doxycycline reaction resulting in you know, severe ocular surface condition has some blepharon formations, um, has several instances of persistent epithelial defects, um, trichiasis that, you know, um, resulted in electroablation therapy, um, often constant um, epilation, and then in addition, resulting with everything, she had very dense brunescent cataracts in both eyes. And so, you know, when I started seeing her, she had been on multiple therapies with minimum symptom relief, pain, itching, redness, decrease in vision. She had been monitored and kind of a consistent therapy of using long-term use of contours for a couple months, 22 to 24 millimeters, and we would just um, exchange them out every few months, which resulted for protection's sake, which was good, but still patient wasn't, the patient wasn't able to you know, improve their vision and consistently had about 2200 vision. The ocular surface was so poor that the cataract surgeon and cornea specialist, was, they were not going to do surgery on the eye at the point. So we wanted to implement scleral lenses to improve the ocular surface for cataract surgery. So this is a tool that our department uses quite a bit, that we start the fitting beforehand, before cataract surgery, to improve the surface. We eventually change things and adjust it after surgery, but at the same time, help improve the outcome of the surgery because we know that the chance for complications, specifically these patients, persistent epi defects, things like that are quite high. So we want to make sure we're reducing the risk. And then afterwards, we're going to use the scleral lens for vision, protection, and comfort. So we can see here going back, actually, we can see the severe dryness, the staining, and this is a prototypical staining we're going to see for these patients with Stephen Johnson syndrome or any of those severe ocular surface conditions we were talking about. Very, very high diffuse uh, punctate epithelial erosions. This is a photo of her uh, wearing the 24 millimeter uh, contour lens, again, providing quite a bit of comfort or protection actually, but very uncomfortable because there'd be bubble formation, there would be, you know, just the thickness of the lens and it was just not providing a comfortable um, scenario for her. So we did start the scleral lens fitting. However, due to the surface of the eye and just the severe surface, we were getting similar, this is a stock photo, but a photo nonetheless, a similar scenario of the surface poor wetting just due to the ocular surface of her eye. And so what we did was we know this was a time where we implemented new technology, another example of utilizing new technology, tangible hydropeg. Hydropeg technology allows for greater lubricity, reduction of surface deposits, and increases water retention. So reducing that 
poor wetting surface. And so you're gonna have a slicker, smoother surface resulting in a, a surface that's gonna allow patients to provide consistent, happy vision regarding the front surface of the eye. And so this patient used, I used a Visionary Optics Europa 18 millimeter lens, another, again, another large diameter lens to provide a large surface area protection to achieve great vision. And this is a very, very cool story of a patient that was suffering with 2200 vision for quite a period of time. And then we were able to improve her ocular surface to get to cataract surgery. And then after cataract surgery, achieve 2020 vision consistently. And so patients that have these, you know, systemic or reaction, like high inflammatory conditions on their eye, they're gonna have these waxing and waning moments. So looking at this fit, it looks good to me, but you're gonna look and see, you know, there are areas of redness, injection, and there's areas that look like blanching. And so you have to really monitor these patients very closely, and you're gonna monitor them very closely with cornea and feeling very comfortable and closely co-managing, because you're gonna have these changes and you have to understand when there's a change, when we need to kind of look into changing the fit or taking a break from the lens or kind of changing the treatment protocol. And so these are all things that you have to keep in mind for a lot of these patients with severe ocular surface conditions. Again, utilizing the large surface is gonna be important in a large coverage, but also kind of monitoring them very closely. So overall, we know there's disadvantages and advantages to scleral lenses. And so we know with our advantages, we're gonna get visual improvement, we're gonna get comfort, we're gonna provide protection and coverage with the lens, depending on the size, we're gonna get lubrication, and now there's greater technology to provide customization, just from our torics to our quadrant specific, to our, co to our coatings, um, to our impression molding, scleral technology, all of that. And then utilizing our technologies as you know, photo documentation, anterior segment OCT, all of that put together to get a very efficient fit. That being said, there are some disadvantages where you know, handling the lens for insertion and removal can be quite different and challenging for some patients that may have some dexterity problems. The fruiting process could be a bit longer and that could affect specifically maybe your practice modality and how that can fit into your practice. Is that something that you're looking into? And so the other aspect is midday fogging. I know that's something that with these new technologies we're reducing, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's still gonna be there. And it's hard to kind of get a good picture. And you know, with new studies that are happening, hopefully we can get a better understanding. We are getting a better understanding, but um, where do we go from there? And then again, the last thing that is always discussed is cost. You know, scleral lenses are a bit more expensive. Again, varies if the patient has um, insurance coverage, uh, with medical versus vision plan and how that plays a factor. But, you know, it can be a costly endeavor for these patients. And so you really want to talk to them about this process and kind of time with the lens. I titled this navigating the anterior segment, right? So how do we get from point A to point B and how do we get to scleral lenses, right? And so there's a lot of different regimens. And so kind of going out of order in what I've described here, but we want to exhaust our therapies. We want to make sure we're trying as many different things as possible before we get to scleral lenses, because it is a quite a bit of a change for the patient. And so it's a great therapy, but at the same time, it is quite a bit of an investment in the time, cost, et cetera. So you want to try everything else possible before we get to that point. And then also going back to the keratoconic patients, let's not forget about our corneal RGPs, our custom soft lenses, our hybrids, our tr post-transplant patients that we may worry about corneal edema, these are still a great option, so don't forget about those. Don't be afraid to go big with scleral lenses. And, you know, we're hearing new things with, you know, thin lenses, smaller diameter, again, worrying about oxygen permeability. At the same time, there's a lot of information clinically with many different groups that we can go larger as long as we're monitoring these patients well. We have to fit them properly. There's things that we have to look out for, and we have to use the latest technologies of high DK material, utilizing these technologies, just like I was saying with surface coatings and utilizing anterior segment OCT to kind of see exactly micron value where we're at, we can be able to be more comfortable going larger. But again, we have to understand what are potential complications with all these sorts of things. And so again, you know, I just wanted to conclude and say, you know, there's a lot of different options out there when we're managing anterior segment, but I wanted to focus a little bit more on the scleral lens side of things and focusing primarily on keratoconus and dry eye being two that are often that we see in clinic. So that concludes my talk. Um, thanks for listening. And I'm going to take some questions here shortly. But again, here's my email address. Feel free to reach out anytime. If you have any questions, happy to help. And so um, thanks again and enjoy. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Um, that was a fantastic talk. Our producer is going to be patching Pratik in with me here momentarily to continue the conversation. And thanks for sharing those great cases and giving everybody some insights into anterior segment disease, scleral lenses. Obviously, you're, you're quite an expert. I fit uh, maybe 
a couple of sclera lenses in my career, not not too many. So that was definitely refreshing for me. And uh, you know, how did you get interested in scleral lenses from the get go? Uh, you know, what caused you to focus so heavily on them? Yeah, I think a lot of it had to do with um, my externships at SUNY in my fourth year. Um, I was fortunate enough to have the contact lens externship in my first rotation in the summer. So it got me a chance to just talk about, like learn about specialty lenses uh, right away. Um, and just scleral lenses in addition, like at that time it was still, um, you know, new technologies were coming out and it just felt really cool to be in the forefront of a lot of this and see a lot of the new technologies and going to events like the Global Symposium uh, for specialty lenses. And so that's kind of where I got interested in those types of events and scleral lenses in general. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I went to SUNY as well. I did the same externship. It was such a fantastic experience, and that's really how I got my toes wet, my fingers my fingers wet, maybe right into scleral lenses, and uh, that definitely helped me out in the beginning when I did a couple of them. But I guess it's like anything else. It's like an instrument, right? If you don't uh, practice and do it enough, you start to lose those skills. And I know later on, it, it's it was one of those things where I said, man, I wish I, I kept up with that, or or I'd like to, to pursue this and, and start doing more of it, but I had lost a lot of that knowledge I had. So, you know, what kind of uh, advice do you have, or, or how can you get comfortable with scleral lenses if if you haven't really had all the experience, maybe from an externship or maybe from a residency, you know, where yeah. can you learn those nuts and bolts? Yeah. So I think, you know, we're in a really cool time right now where we have a lot of great resources right at our fingertips, you know, um, a lot of great groups um, that we can learn about scleral lenses, um, like scleral lens practitioners on Facebook. That's a great one if you're not a part of, and it's, it's a, uh, led by, uh, Tom Arnold and some um, great practitioners that just talk about basics of scleral lenses, advanced cases, and kind of the spectrum and how you can get involved. Um, GPLI is another amazing source that has great webinars um, to talk talks about the basics to intermediate to advanced uh, ways to get uh, used to scleral lenses and just in general, also any type of specialty lens. And so there's some really good resources out there that you could do that. And then also attending a meet, attending meetings. You know, there's great well, uh, workshops, lectures that kind of get to get to the topics. And then in addition, talk to the people that um, kind of do these more often and get a sense of what, you know, how they started and get a sense of um, them being a resource that if in at some point, if you have a challenging case, you're not sure you could reach out to them personally. And so I think there's multiple ways to get involved. And so um, definitely something to utilize scleral lenses and you have resources to go to right away. Yeah, for sure. And and it's interesting, a couple of questions just came in that I think piggyback a lot off of what you had just said. And one of the questions here is, I'm starting a new practice and starting lean. What is your advice for getting started without OCT. So you spoke a lot about OCT and how you utilize it in your presentation, of course, but what advice do you have around particular fitting set, lens designs? Yeah. Uh, I know you already spoke a bit about the websites and the online training videos, but you know, what's your advice there? Right, and so picking a lab is, uh, is, is a challenging one because there's so many manufacturers out there and how to fit, fit a comfortable uh, scleral lens based on the you know, fitting sets and whatnot. Um, if you're a new practitioner, I know there are several companies that offer, uh, if you're a new grad and a new practitioner, they may offer discounts on fitting sets based on being a new grad, um, for example. So utilizing those um, aspects and they can also, you know, have discounts on the first le lens or two as well. So that can help kind of ease you into um, trying a, a fit right away instead of um, kind of worried about, you know, based on cost and all that kind of stuff. And so there's there's really no wrong answer. You have to look at your, you know, price structure, um, the how much does the lens cost for you, um, and then move forward with that because there's a lot of different varieties, you know, um, with each lab. And so there's little, little details on that end, but in general, all the labs work really well. A lot of these lenses work really well nowadays and they're very customizable. Yeah, fantastic. And a, a follow-up question here, and, and I'm not sure if you've got experience with this here, Pratik, but uh, the question is, is can you use ProGent Cleaner with HydroPeg coating? You cannot um, because of the uh, material, the, I believe the, the alcohol base or the bleach agent. And so that's one. But um, to confirm again, when you work with HydroPeg, there are, there's a list of um, um, 
allowed um, solution. So if I'm incorrect, I apologize, but from my understanding, I believe Progen can, cannot use it, use it at this time. Fantastic. And uh, just out of curiosity here, and, and uh, you spoke a lot in your presentation about uh, RGPs as well, and, and maybe some situations where you might reach for those, but, and obviously, it seems like you're you're more favorable towards sclerals, but are there situations where you would tell yourself, you know what, I'm going to fit this RGP because of X, Y, Z, or, or do you typically like to reach for sclerals first as your first choice, if possible? It's it's never my first choice, honestly. Although in my mind, I'm, I'm always calculating the best. You know, you, there's a, there's this cost benefit analysis off of the patients, um, what what could work best with them. So you kind of have to look at what visually, like the 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 anatomy of the cornea, is it going to be easier to fit a, a scleral to vault over the cornea versus, for those reasons, versus um, patient's handling of the lens um, tends to be, you know, a couple more extra steps with a scleral lens. So you have to look at the dexterity, things like that. Um, and then in addition, um, the corneal health as well, for example, for working with a transplant eye um, that may have a lower endothelial cell count, we tend to go to a corneal RGP potentially as an option compared to scleral lens due to the risk for corneal edema and things like that. Um, even for patients that uh, have higher prescriptions, um, like high myopia, aphakic or whatnot, you tend, I tend to try to stick with the RGP if possible with the corneal RGP. I think uh, in general, again, you have to put a lot of factors into it. And so for me personally, I do fit a lot of sclerals, but it's never that I'm right away, like that's my first option. It just just so happens based on kind of in my head, kind of calculating it out and then it goes that route. But uh, it definitely you have to think about it in, in, that, in that sense, like an equation in a way. Yeah, for sure. And, and when I was out there practicing as well, just the thought of sclerals was, it was so scary just because of the size of the lens. And yeah. I was much more confident and comfortable with RGPs. And even when I was out there practicing outside of SUNY, outside of school, and, and even though I was in a practice that didn't do a whole lot of those, I did have keratoconic patients and, and I was helping them with RGPs and I found myself working with a, a lab and it was more of a, hey, uh, have you, I, I was talking to the senior, senior doctor there, the senior practice owner, it was like, hey, have you ever done, I know you don't do a lot of these, but is there a lab that I should work with. Uh, do you have any advice around uh, for those that want to bring this to their practice? Just just understanding what kind of lab to work with, who to choose, uh, that kind of thing? Yeah, so there's a few factors with uh, labs that you want to look at. Um, again, my experience with the labs, that, with all the labs I've worked up with are great. And you really have to look at um, how you comfortably feel with working with a customer service and consultation for ordering lenses and how to make changes. Because if you can um, do that and get a good sense of if they can help you guide you in, in the early stages, you get a better understanding of the lens. And then in addition, uh, reduces the chance of the number of remakes you may need to make. And that's on a patient satisfaction side of things. And then in addition, what's the warranty process for the lens? You know, that's also important. Like, do you have to ship the lens, uh, the previous lens back to the lab versus, um, the, you know, we, get, we don't have to do that. And then what is their warranty period? And how does it work with invoices and all that kind of stuff? And so um, not just the product itself, you have to look at that. And then so it's the people, the, the lab location may be another potential aspect. Although with like, you know, uh, overnight and ground two day shipping, it's quicker, but you know, being close to the same coast may be beneficial, um, same country, you know, things like that. So there's a lot of varieties of various reasons. And so um, you have to kind of look at it in the practice management side of things as well, not just, just the product itself. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Pratik, for all of the great information. I, I'm not sure if you can see the live chat going on, but I can tell you a lot of people uh, are just reaching out to here saying thank you very much. It was a fantastic presentation and and uh, and a couple of questions here just about um, if this presentation will be made available for viewing. Uh, afterwards, the answer to that is yes. You'll be able to uh, view Pratik's presentation and every presentation uh, today and tomorrow, and you'll be able to find those on demand at the Zeiss uh, Professional Education Portal. We had given you that uh, URL previously, but we can certainly put it in the chat there for those watching so you can find it a little more easily. And uh, just time for, it looks like a, maybe another question here. And that question for you, Pratik, is, looks like this could be our last question. Is a, an ultra health lens preferred 
over a high DK scleral lens and a post PKP patient with low endothelial cell count and roughly less than 800 cells. So my, my answer to that is use a corneal RGP. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So uh, if you guys have any more questions, of course, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, Pratik directly. I know you had left your contact information in your in your slides there. And once again, that will be made available. So thanks, Pratik, again for joining us. Uh, really appreciate you taking your time to share your knowledge with us. We'll definitely do a part two at the next event. And for those of you who are going to uh, stick with us here throughout the remainder of the show, we're going to be heading over to the practice management stage to talk telemedicine. So you'll want to keep an eye out for a little uh, beacon bar, a link that will take you directly there. You can simply use the conference hall. If you're in there, you can navigate to that stage. We've got two great speakers who are gonna be talking all about telemedicine, how to bring it to your practice, everything in between. So if you're following along with us, head over to the stage and we'll see you there.